Um, so b basically, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say that there, there weren't issues with armed police officers in Scotland. It was a very small number. So I'll, I'll move things on a bit. In, in the 1990s, there was a, a decision taken to have bodies for the whole of Scotland, um, uh, the police college, the National Drug Squad, dealt with by a committee of appointees. And at that time, I was a, a police federation official, a police union official, and I was the only one that complained. Everyone said, no, no, it's okay, these are good people. But it lost the democratic accountability, and for me, that was the start of things um, being problematic. Now, I'm going to talk about armed response vehicles, because I know that in your, uh, that, that's um, the reason I was asked here. And if I, I tell you that these first started in Scotland in the 1990s, and to ensure that you had two police officers in one vehicle, 365 days a year, you needed to train 18 officers. That was 18 officers. Now, eventually through the 90s, that was rolled out over Scotland. And I'm from the Highlands and Islands, very remote area, um, lots of spread out, a population of about a quarter of a million over an area the size of Belgium and bigger. And we had two officers. Now, um, the Scottish government decided that there was going to be one police force for the whole of Scotland. This wasn't because people wanted it. I, I didn't want it. It was because of the financial pressures put on by the Westminster government. So there's a political decision that's going to trigger a lot of change. Um, but let me tell you what the reform was supposed to do. And this is a quote. The reform was supposed to safeguard frontline policing in communities. In communities. By creating, and this was very important, by creating local senior officers for every council area with a statutory duty. So it was the law, part of the law, that this local senior officer would work with the councils to shape local services. Now, I was very happy to support that. That was the, the model that has accountability, very local accountability. It's still in place. And what they said as well, that this would allow all the specialist services that existed mainly in the centres of population to be rolled out to the rural areas. And that became important too. Because it's at that point that there's a rollout of, or when we get further on, they roll out the firearms teams. Now, there were concerns about centralisation, and we've heard that from Oscar, about the centralisation of phone systems. That's happened in Scotland too. And of political control. The political tr control never materialised. Because in Scotland, the one thing that was always seen as being uh, very important was the phrase, the operational independence of the police. So whilst a general direction would be given by politicians, they would not intervene on particular issues. Now, when we go to talk about the armed service, you can see that that immediately becomes problematic. Um, and the timing was important because we had a change... Um, a change system, um, and um, given the time that we've, we've lost with that, I'll maybe just move straight through it to say that we had a change of, of, of arrangements from eight forces to one at the time uh, when the local authorities had an election looming. So we had a, a period where there was a vacuum of political accountability. The new authority that was put in place to oversee policing wasn't yet up and running, the councils were on their way out, and um, there was a vacuum. I hope that translates. And policing became very politicised. You had a situation where there was a minority government that was committed to delivering a 1,000 more officers than when it took office. The opposition had ridiculed this. They said it would take 30 years to have a 1,000 more officers. They got a 1,000 more officers. Then there's another political decision that has wide-ranging ramifications, because with the cash pressures of appointing a 1,000 officers, and you can't in Scotland make police officers redundant, they are public servants who couldn't be made redundant, you had to make the support staff redundant. So the people in the offices, the people in the phones and the control rooms, they are made redundant, and you now have police officers doing that role. Um, Someone came to me, um, two, two, two or three people came to me with concerns about armed officers, and I said, no, no, it's okay. It's, it's, their, it's their battens, because there's a new type of batten that you're seeing, and it's, not, it's in a holster. Or on other occasions, I said, it's your C, the CS incapacitant spray, like a pepper spray. Um, 
But the person that came, a former police officer, said, no, definitely they had guns. And I made some inquiry into this. And uh, because my relationship with the police had changed at senior level, they, I was scrutinizing them and they didn't like it. Um, rather than go to the police about this, I went to a newspaper with all the evidence. And um, the evidence was that police officers were driving in vehicles and where in the past in my part of the world, we had one vehicle with weapons locked in the boot in a safe with authority required from a senior police officer to even open the safe to a situation where officers were driving about with a pistol on their hip and they were dealing with ordinary incidents, routine incidents, not firearms incidents, not life-threatening incidents, stopping cars for speeding, stopping cars parking. And that's not the sort of policing that the community wanted. Um, I have to say, um, it was important to use the press, and uh, if you, the, the press are, are not hostile to the police in Scotland, but th this was um, a quality press who would go on the evidence that was presented. Um, I met the police, um, and I invited all my colleagues, my colleagues from the four other parties, Two of them came along, two of the parties came along, and uh, I suggested to the piece that, that it was important to revert to the previous arrangement where the public were perfectly happy. Um, I think that uh, the uh, chief constable wasn't very enthusiastic about that, and uh, um, I also suggested other ways they could avoid a, a, a problems, but they, they didn't like that. They then started a campaign using the press to say, this man doesn't know what he's talking about, um, it would take our officers 20 minutes to get the, on occasions to get the guns out the boot to attend an incident. And they didn't like when I said, if it takes someone 20 minutes to get a gun out of a boot, then not only should they not be in charge of a gun, they shouldn't be in charge of a car either. I don't know if that translates, but it was... Um, and then, quite unusually, there was an armed robbery in the town where I live. And the police were so excited about that. See, we needed to have guns. There was an armed robbery. Well, there had always been armed robberies. They were very occasional, and they're still very occasional. There hasn't been an armed robbery since. But um, the, that was one of the lines they used. They then, when that had no traction, they then said the rural area that he lives in has 40,000 people with firearms, certificates and firearms. And I said, that's entirely correct. Who gave them the firearm certificates? It was the police that gave them the firearm certificates. Presumably, they wouldn't have given them certificates if it wasn't uh, responsible. So um, they then said that the issue had been agreed by this previous board to arm them. But fortunately, and I mean fortunately, they later admitted that that wasn't the case. So they had lied. Uh, they had made very general statements to the previous board about standardizing procedures when we got the new force. So I raised the issue in Parliament. I asked about something, and I think you might find this helpful in future, is uh, something called a community impact assessment. What is the effect in the community of doing this operational change? Um, and the Cabinet Secretary, asked, I asked him, um, had a community impact assessment been prepared before the decision to deploy armed response vehicles overtly carrying firearms to routine non-firearms incidents in the Highlands and Islands. And he said, I cannot answer that. Mr Finney would have to ask the former Chief Constable of Northern Constabulary, who's now retired, and the former Board of Northern Constabulary, which is now disbanded. So, the Justice Minister in the Parliament suggested I speak to someone who wasn't imposed into a board that no longer uh, existed. And, and I have to say that was, that was very disappointing. Um, we maintained a, me a campaign through the social media and people kept sending me pictures of armed police officers. I, I knew what armed police officers looked like, but the, they would see them in filling stations and all over the place. And um, that was very helpful, the media campaign. But there was one thing that changed it more than anything else. Um, a press photographer took a, f a photograph of three armed officers dealing with young boys having a row, an argument, outside of McDonald's in Inverness. And everyone went, well, this is ridiculous. Three armed officers. Um, bear in mind, we only thought there was two on duty anyway. Um, so um, uh, 
questions were brushed off again. I tried other, and eventually a, a, a ministerial statement was made in the Scottish Parliament. Um, and I asked the Cabinet Secretary if he would publish all the papers connected with the decision-making process. And again, he said, I don't have that information. That would apply to previous boards. Um, and again, referring me backwards. But he took the opportunity to say, there was an armed incident, there was a very bad road accident in the motorway two days ago and armed officers attended and they, they looked after the woman who was injured and isn't that great? Well, of course it's great. No one ever suggested that a police officer wouldn't attend to someone who's injured in the street. That's totally different from two armed officers turning up in a supermarket to deal with a shoplifter. So um, I have to say that um, they thought they would change tack and what they agreed was that the police authority, the body now charged with looking after this national force, would undertake an inquiry into the whole issue. And they would also have the inspector of constabulary, the official person charged with inspecting the police, to uh, do a report as well. And the report would be about the decision to deploy armed officers on routine duties. Because this wasn't about armed officers not going to armed incidents. This was about routine arming. Um, now, if the Scottish Government thought that these two issues would uh, mean that the matter would go quiet, they were entirely wrong. And less than two months after they made that announcement, um, pardon me, I was very pleased to know that they had given in to public pressure and they changed the policy. Um, and it's important because of something Oscar said there, the, the word perception. Rather than feel safe, my constituents went, why are they armed? We must be unsafe if they're armed. It didn't reassure people. It made people uncertain. And uh, so what the chief constable announced was that firearms officers in these armed response vehicles will now only be sent to issues where there's firearms sentences or where life's in threat. Now, they've since modified that slightly to say, well, you wouldn't drive past someone that's injured, and, you know, the, the officers to use their judgment. But it was a very huge win for a campaign, and what I would say, it shows that political pressure can, can uh, succeed. Um, and it also brought about very public scrutiny from a police committee in the parliament, which was, I was a member of. And one other issue that I have to touch on about this time was because we didn't have the local police services with the local commanders responsible to the chief cons um, to the, the board who had appointed them, we also had um, not only armed officers in rural areas, and I had reports of armed officers at charity events in small villages, um, but also there was a system of stop and search that the chief constable had introduced stopping and searching citizens. And there's been a lot of academic research done about this. And um, uh, if, I, if I tell you, and it's very hard to believe perhaps, but if I tell you that there was higher levels of stop and search, people being stopped and searched in Scotland, than there was in the Metropolitan Police or in the New York Police Department. That shows you the level that there was. Again, um, we looked into this. Um, and uh, some of the actions were illegal. Um, the uh, government took a different tack. They appointed an inquiry to look into this, headed by a senior and well-respected human rights lawyer, John Scott. Um, I have to tell you, in the middle of this, we had a senior police officer come to the parliament and tell us lies, because uh, uh, we had asked for the statistics, and what he had said was, they used to be available, but they're not anymore because someone pushed a button by mistake and deleted them all. Quite incredible. He didn't even believe that. I don't know how much time I have, Chair, um, but um, yeah, um, I'm okay. Yeah. Twelve minutes. All right. Okay. Thanks. Well. Uh, okay. Um, well, you, you please tell me to, to stop if you wish. C can I say that the, 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 yes, the police... Yes. Yeah. Two minutes? Twelve. Twelve, okay. <laughs> right, okay. The, uh, the police, the police uh, authority report, um, uh, people told me that uh, the report that they published was inaccurate. 
and it was inaccurate because um, before they'd completed their inquiry, before they published it, they sent it to the police to say, what do you think is the report? And the police said, we'd like you to alter that, we'd like you to alter this. And um, that, that was disappointing. Uh, that won't happen again. That won't happen again. I tried to use legislation to get a copy of the report. And because they had used a commercial company to do the investigation, they told me that it was commercial in confidence and they couldn't have it. Um, but um, everyone knew that uh, it had been altered, and that's the important thing. And I just want to touch briefly on why these problems uh, uh, arose. And I do appreciate it's a different situation in the Basque Country. And, and it's a situation that would be greatly enhanced by the Spanish police service getting out. I, I absolutely understand that. But this was a new organisation. And I have to say, as an individual, I tried to give this organisation a very positive start. I, I had succeeded in persuading the government to also have the official name in Gaelic, they didn't want that, but we, got, we have the Polis and Halipa uh, Police Service of Scotland. But most importantly, I got them to agree to alter the oath that police officers take to include an undertaking for them to hold, uphold citizens' human rights. Now, I wanted the same oath as there is in the north of Ireland, but they thought that was too political. But we'd, new police officers in Scotland now swear an oath to uphold the human rights of citizens. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. We also had a, a situation where we had a very powerful man who people weren't prepared to question. They had a propaganda offensive that this was the style of policing that needed in this day and age. But fundamentally, the police service had forgotten its goal. And its goal is very simple. And it was to guard the community, watch the community, protect the community and the community's property. And to do that, they didn't need the guns. And policing had become political. So um, I, I'm going to suggest some of the solutions and then maybe some points that, that are up for debate. It, you need constant scrutiny of public services, and the police is no different. Uh, you need a robust um, authority to oversee this, and that's happened there. We have a new authority. The chief constable and the deputy chief constable who were responsible for this have gone. The new senior officers are in place are people who understand the concept of policing by consent and human rights. There's more scrutiny than ever. There's a police committee in the parliament and I'm pleased to say that I'm on the justice committee and the police committee. And importantly, because the police authority had felt they'd been made vulnerable by the way the police had acted, the police now have to report anything they think the public might think is controversial to the authority before they consult the public whether the public will let them perform these duties. So I think the issues that came up um, were the, what is operational policing and what is political interference in policing? What did consultation mean? Because public bodies will tell you, we consulted with the public. Well, consulting with the public isn't telling them what you're going to do after you're done, you've done it. It is about speaking to people, listening to people, and that's what they had forgotten. We need the checks and balances. We need, most importantly, and again a point that Oscar made, we need local involvement. The people in the Highlands want to be policed by people from the Highlands. The people in the Basque Country want to be policed for people in the Basque Country. I accept not everyone wants to be policed, but can I say for the reasons Oscar outlined, you do in any liberal democracy, in any, you need some form of support for the citizens. And uh, that, to my mind, comes from the police. Um, Civic Scotland was very concerned about what they saw as the militarisation of the police service in Scotland as a result of these changes. And, and th there are problems that remain. The call centres issue that, that Oscar talked about, um, that's happened. They've closed call centres to save money. But sometimes, sometimes, I mean, I, the... the constituency I represent is the bigger than Belgium with three island groups. It's, it's inconceivable that someone would pick up the phone and, and everyone who answers the phone would know everywhere. But we need... Community is about local. It's the, the effect of lots of local things building up. It's not the big thing pushing down. So absolutely that needs to be looked at. Um, You all remember the tragedy in Paris of the, the terrorist attack there. 
Um, something that happened is the police came to the parliament and asked to meet with the party leaders and the justice spokespeople to say that they made an assessment that they needed more armed officers. Now, it's a small number of armed officers, additional armed officers. And they explained that this was because of the threat level. And we listened. And um, this is where the trust begins, because they didn't say exactly what the threat level was. Um, you have to take some things in trust. And we agreed that modest increase. But the most important thing was they came to ask. They didn't do it. And um, there's a problem with the threat level too, and it's something again that, that uh, Oscar touched on, and that is the role of the media. Because there are a lot of people, a lot of elderly people reading newspapers who are bolting themselves into their house at night because they think robbers will get them, terrorists will get them, paedophiles will get their children. And whose interests are being served by sp building up that perception of, of, of crime? Um, so. What I asked them, I, we agreed, myself and the party leader agreed that this was appropriate, but we said, how do you reduce the threat level? What are you doing to make sure that the threat level is reduced and you're not needing to deploy armed officers? Well, it is the question of education that you touched on. It is the question of more trust, um, and, and it, it's not easily answered. You, you, you may know that um, an English parliamentarian colleague was murdered in the street by a fascist. Are you aware of this? It's not been reported as a, 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 a neo-Nazi attack. That's what it was. It was because she supported immigrants like we support immigrants. And after that, the police were coming to my office, coming to all the other parliamentarians' office. And uh, we don't want to be bolted in offices. Our office, you can come and knock at the door of my office and come in. Parliamentarians, like the rest of the pub, uh, public sector, have to be available to serve the citizens. And we can't be brow beaten by, by that. So I think we always have to ask ourselves about the threat level and the role that diplomacy pays in that, plays in that. Uh, because the same people who see a threat from migrants are the same people who wouldn't want you to spend money in overseas aid helping people. Um, um, we need a proportional response to, to, to things. Um, uh, I was a police dog handler um, for many years. People would know that if they were abusing me with their mouth, I wouldn't set the dog on them. Um, that's, that's, you know, just any more than uh, it was appropriate or proportional to have armed officers attending some of these incidents. What we also need is we need informed citizens. Citizens need to know their rights. No one should be scared of citizens knowing their rights. No one should be scared of young people knowing their rights. When we had industrial levels of stop and search, young people were being alienated by the police. That's the future generation. We can't have that. People need to know their rights to refuse to be stopped and, and, and search. And uh, that is about, again, about education. We need active politicians because I have to tell you, some of my local council colleagues were less than vigilant with this issue. Um, they weren't involved and they, they didn't think they could influence, so they didn't do anything. And of course, after the issue was raised, they went, oh, yes, it's terrible. But they should have been scrutinizing. Um, we need accountability mechanisms. And if I tell you that um, the, the, one of the examples I understood to be to refer to in, in the, the, the opening address that we heard there was the death, if I understand, of a, a Singalese man in, in custody. Um, certainly I understand that there was one of the, that recently. In Scotland, that would automatically, automatically trigger something called a fatal accident inquiry. There would be a, an inquiry in the court by in front of a judge of everyone involved. If someone dies within 24 hours of had the contact with the police, there's a fatal accident inquiry. And we also have a, yes, thank you. We also have a, a, an organisation that investigates the police, it's a civilian organization, and they have the same powers of detention and search and seizing property as, as, as the police have. So demand accountability. Um, as, as was said again by, by the gentleman who, who introduced tonight's uh, event, policing should be done with and for communities. Policing isn't something that should be done to communities. Um, security isn't about policing. You could have a police officer in nearly every street corner and the street corner you don't have a police officer in is the one where the incident will be. What brings security is having confident citizens who are prepared to challenge wrongdoing. 
And that comes about from a sense of community and trust. So the situation, and I don't wish to intrude, but it would seem to me the situation that you have here has potential if you have your local councillors involved in local decision making with a no, known local officer. That's not going to happen when you have the Spanish police here. They have to go. It has to be Basque people policing the Basque country. Um, and I'm just going to finish by saying one final thing. I, I talked about the, re the, the, the review of Stop and Search and the human rights lawyer. The human rights lawyer said, and I got the chief constable to agree in Parliament this was important. He was very critical of the action the police had taken, but he said the public should rightly look at the police as being the frontline defenders of citizens' human rights. And I think if we get to that situation, then that's, that's in everyone's interests. So thank you very much indeed. More in time.